So, okay. So just to introduce, um, well, not only myself, but maybe also the Alan Turing Institute, which is, the, which is one of the two institutions I'm affiliated with. You may or no, may not be familiar with it. It's the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI, founded a couple of years ago with the aim to catalyze the uh, research application uh, translation and innovation cycle. So the two institute does foundational research. It aims at applying this directly to solving real world problems. It also provides training to the next generation of leaders in the area, and it's also meant to advise policymakers and shape the public discourse. Now, if you are a member of one of the 13 partner universities, you can become a fellow by applying to one of the regular calls. But the institute also has its own staff. The fellows are fellows by secondment, but the institute is regularly hiring staff at all seniority levels. It has its own growing research engineering group and a cohort of PhD students, as well as research assistants at PhD and postdoc level. So there's applications open on which you can look at the Turing website. There is events happening. You can get involved, for example, in data study groups where companies present events and you can apply to participate and work on a one-week intensive uh, event uh, to scope approaches, data scientific approaches. You can also get involved with one of the numerous tools projects that happen in the recently started, so it's quite, quite new, end of last year, the tools practices and systems theme that is now ramping up at the Turing and which will be hiring soon. And remember, we have taps from which coffee flows at the institute. That is not, that is not a joke. <laughs> so, back to my talk. So this is about the SK Pro package which sits in the scikit-learn and PyData ecosystem. What I'm going to talk about is the package itself, which is a tool, but also it is as much a package as it is a vision of things it can do or should eventually do. So this talk is split in two parts. First, explaining what is probabilistic supervised learning, so predicting with an uncertainty estimate of the prediction itself, as well as highlighting in which respect SK Pro can or cannot yet do that. So uh, contributors, Fritjof Gressmann, who is the main developer of um, SK Pro, couldn't be here today. He was originally supposed to, uh, to give the, um, uh, well, presentation of uh, uh, the, the uh, Jupyter Notebook presentation, but he's been now hired by a large uh, um, uh, ML AI hardware company, so he couldn't be here because he needs to go to ICML, and I believe he needs to check whether uh, there's anything interesting happening. So it will be just me uh, giving this talk, but Fritjof is really the main developer behind, behind the package itself, and we're currently looking for a new developer because his professional endeavors don't allow him that much more in terms of further developing the package. So there might be some hiring rounds upcoming as well. So. References, there's a longer paper on the vision, probabilistic supervised learning, which has appeared as an archive preprint and is still under review, so it has appeared last year. I've uh, pushed a new version with uh, um, some typos fixed, and there is one short paper that is exclusively about the package SK Pro, which has appeared in the MLOS, so the machine learning open source of the workshop in Europe last year. Okay, what is this about? What, so first part, what is the general vision of probabilistic supervised learning? If you recall supervised learning, for those of you who are familiar with scikit-learn, right? So you have uh, a learning machine, which in scikit-learn is an abstract estimator class that ingests training data feature label pairs. So for example, multiple pieces of information, if it's yellow and round, it's a lemon. So yellow, round, lemon, yellow and round being the features, or it's yellow and not round, it's maybe a banana. So yellow, not round, banana. So this is in the training phase, the learning machine uh, constructs a representation of the reality as observed through these features and labels. That's a fitted model. And later on, it uses that to make predictions when you have only features. So for example, if it is yellow and if it is round, what is it? It's maybe, it's maybe a lemon. Then you have all these kinds of uh, tuning parameters and the interface that scikit-learn provides for that. 
as there is a lot of examples in the machine learning zoo of supervised learning, which is um, the bread and butter for many machine learners to come up with new methods or improvements upon methods or proving something about these methods. Now what this talk is going to be about is the predictions with uncertainty or, uh, probabil or probability estimates. So one way you can call supervised learners is making a point prediction, which is essentially the learning machine tells you, I'm certain this is an apple because it's round and it's not yellow. Or you can make a probabilistic prediction, say I'm 25, in 25% 25 of cases this is probably a banana, but in 75% of cases in the long term it's going to be an apple. If you're familiar with scikit-learn, you will recognize that this maps directly on two interface points, key interface points, the predict method and the predict proba method from the scikit-learn package. So what we are going to talk about is predict proba like things. So obtaining this kind of predictions not only in a classification, but in a regression sense, which SK Pro means to address. So more generally, right, you might be familiar for classification, which is maybe the most frequently used case in practice. Scikit-learn more or less covers this already with the predict proba interface. So, but just to explain what do these probabilities mean, they, they are frequentist probabilities if you invoke predict proba for the models that scikit-learn implements, they will be frequentist probabilities, meaning if you have these features, out of 100 independent cases, say 25 are going to be bananas, 30 are going to be apples, 45 are going to be frogs, or whatever, whatever kind of classes you want to put them into. So this is different from the Bayesian belief probabilities, Primarily, we'll be talking about the frequency probabilities. So in long term, if you have these features, what are you expecting to observe? Now, for regression, let's say you want to predict the number, right? So want to predict a patient's individual survival in terms of, in terms of years, given uh, demographics, given, uh, given the therapy they have received. So what is that number or, say, you want to, to do one of the things that uh, the uh, hosts and sponsors of this event like to do. There it might also be useful. So one way to do this is to produce predictive intervals, which say, for example, in 95% of the cases of long term, the observation will be between these two numbers. Or you can go fully probabilistic, right? So you can specify a full distribution over numbers over the reals. So say, in long term, it's going to be as if it were sampled from a Laplace distribution with certain parameters, for example, or normal, or whatever, whatever you want to predict. So that is essentially what SK Pro is meant to cover, especially the regression aspects, which currently it's uh, a little bit difficult to get out of, uh, out of uh, scikit-learn or related packages. So in terms of, in terms of the toolbox, the features that it currently has or in the long term is meant to have um, uh, exhaustively. One is the feature that you know from scikit-learn, a unified interface for probabilistic supervised learning methods. So that means it needs to have a predict method that returns these kinds of probability uh, predictions that you have seen in the, in the last slide. Furthermore, support for the model building and model evaluation workflows that you know and love as well from scikit-learn. That includes the possibility to build pipelines, to have preprocessors, to plug together building blocks like transformers or feature extractors with mod a model interface, to have compositors, say ensemble and, and meta-learning, as well as automated tuning of model parameters, which the interface also is supposed to expose. All for models that output these probabilistic predictions in the regression case, as well as model checking, model evaluation. If a model produces a, a prediction interval, well, is it good or, or, is, it, or is it bad? So especially with a feature being well, frequentist models can do this, Bayesian models can do this, you can also cobble together models in a different way that produce predictive intervals for distributions, and you want to assess all of them fairly with respect to their 
predictive performance as you are doing, say, in scikit-learn uh, based cross-validation experiments. As said, some of these features are more mature than others, and we're looking for a new main dev or at least contributors. Now, what are concrete strategies that do that? What are concrete types of models? So probabilistic supervised classification, mm -hmm. essentially anything that has predict proba and scikit learn, um, or neural networks with the vanilla uh, softmax output, they are also give you probabilities if you, if you don't threshold. But let's talk about regression, say predictive intervals. So green is what is in some way, in some way you can do it with SK Pro at the moment. Uh, it might be more or less buggy depending on what the method is. So SK Learn, some of the some of the methods give you back a mean and a variance. So you can use, of course, these two to get back some predictive interval by using normal approximation for confidence intervals. You can also do two-step prediction. That's a relatively classical method, I think, from the 50s. One method predicts the mean by, say, the squared loss. Then you take the residuals of that, square them, and predict the squared residuals, and then use that as a variance or a scale component, or simply as a, as a width of a predictive interval. Quantile regression models, you might have seen them if you use the quantile loss or the pinball loss, right? You, and maybe if you want to regularize, but this gives you models that predict quantiles. You can predict, say, 97.5% quantile and the 2.5% quantile of the predictive distribution. So you need at least two of these, or you need a joint model. Then you also get uh, predictive intervals. So if you want full distributions, well, if you have a fully specified probabilistic model fit by maximum likelihood or penalized maximum likelihood, such as the a black hole model right, that, uh, that will give you a probabilistic uh, uh, a prediction. There are a couple of models that do so. Conditional density estimation is, is uh, Nadariah Watson style, um, non-parametric density predictions. You can also turn prediction intervals into a fully probabilistic prediction. You take the width of the interval and you put a distribution, you slap a distribution on it, which has a male and may a mean and the scale parameter. Bayesians rejoice. You can take Bayesian predictive posteriors, but there are a number of caveats which I don't have time to talk about today. So not every predictive posterior is actually a predictive distribution with good frequentist properties. It depends on whether you predict a full distribution or whether it's just a belief distribution for a point prediction. If you don't know what this is, don't worry. Ask a Bayesian. Um, and you can do empirical risk minimization with respect to losses that measure the goodness of models that are probabilistic, which I'm going to talk about in the moment. So you could, for example, set up a neural network, which in its output layer gives you a distribution and you could optimize for that and see what happens. Now, as said, we need a main dev, we need contributors. There might be options to do this as, a, as an actual internship job and so on, so let me know if you're interested in that. Now, I've already mentioned this at the end, so what is a, what is a good probabilistic supervised learning? So let's say you have one of these methods, you have a full zoo of methods, and many more than those mentioned in the last slide, which spits out a prediction interval or a full distributional prediction, but is that a reasonable thing that it returns, right? So what, um, what are things to consider there? So frequent mistake, and I just want to say this slowly and clearly, it is a mistake to believe just because an algorithm returns a prediction that is distributional, that is a statement about how uncertain the algorithm is, just because an algorithm returns that, it doesn't mean that is correct. No, the algorithm doesn't need to be right. So a predictive interval may be wrong, just as a point prediction can be wrong. A distributional prediction can be wrong, just as a point prediction can be wrong. Of course, all models are wrong, but some are plain stupid and some are reasonable to use. So um, just to reiterate this, just because, just because an algorithm makes a probabilistic prediction, just because it states how uncertain it is, does it mean, does it, mean it is always correct? No, of course it isn't. Hence, it is important to distinguish, and it might be worthwhile to keep, in mind, keep this in mind in what follows, to distinguish what the algorithm says. Right? So a predictive interval might be, I'm relatively sure the 
value will be in there. But the algorithm can be wrong, so there will be a performance. The algorithm will have a certain performance in making that kind of prediction. For example, the statement will look like on average, no, oh, I did a train, train test split. It has a certain loss, maybe the cross entropy loss of 0.4. Now, in another layer, that statement in itself is uncertain because it is obtained from a finite amount of data in all practical settings. So you might be only certain about where this performance lies, say, in terms of a frequentist confidence interval. So you could compute frequentist asymptotics of algorithmic performance on the test set, then you will get this if you, if you do this in, in, in a clean way. Now, of course, this is different from the prediction itself. It is a statistical statement about the performance of an algorithm that itself may make statements about how uncertain it is. So there's multiple layers here, but it's important to distinguish what is the uncertainty the algorithm claims what is the observed performance of the algorithm in claiming that uncertainty? What is the experimenter's uncertainty on the algorithms about the algorithm's performance? So it's easy to get these com confused, but in my opinion, this is important because it makes a difference if you mix it up or not between an algorithm that works or an algorithm that doesn't work for whatever purpose you want to apply it. Now, if it's survival predictions, if it informs medical decision making, you want to be really sure, right? You do not want to, you do not want to get a therapy re recommendation from an algorithm whose creators have believed that it is always right while it isn't. So how do you measure? How do you measure the goodness of an algorithm that makes probabilistic predictions? So by probabilistic losses, obviously, which, uh, which is theory that is uh, mostly classical, though it is uh, usually not phrased as losses, it is still not something I have invented. Why are probabilistic losses useful? They're useful in two main use cases. One is fitting the model. If you specify, say, a neural network, you're minimizing a loss, or if, you specify, if you're specifying a model, then, say, you want to do a regularized empirical loss or uh, some, some likelihood-based method, then you're already using something about how well, the model, how well the model's outputs fit the data. Second, just evaluating it. Right? How good is the model? How good is the model that you have observed making predictions? In both cases, you need to compare observations that are, say, real numbers with predictions that are distributions or prediction intervals. So on the test set, you will, say, have a 1,000 observations, which are numbers, and a 1,000 predictions, which are individual predictions of distributions. So the loss function needs to compare pairs with apples, an observation that is a number with a distribution that is a distribution over numbers or an interval. So unlike in the classical setting, you will have loss functions where the two arguments are not exchangeable in terms of type, and these, these are not going to be symmetric either. But now, what is, what is a reasonable thing to postulate? So this is maybe the only piece of um, deeper, maybe not, not that deep, depending on what your background is, Martha, that I'm going to show, but it's, it may be important to understand. So the intuition is postulating that making the correct prediction minimizes the loss in the long-term average, so in expectation, mathematically expectation over the data generating process or label generating process here, which is why. So you have to think a bit why this is also telling you that in the conditional case or conditional on features, it's the right thing to do. But I think it's a very reasonable thing to postulate that making the perfect prediction is going to minimize the loss on average. Now, if this doesn't tell you whether such a thing exists, but the alternatives are, well, something else minimizes it. So if you optimize for it, the prediction might be optimizing a criterion it doesn't have to do anything with the truth, anything with the true distribution, but you want the true or generative distribution for the prediction, which, which I think is quite a sensible thing. So one terminological issue, you may have heard the term proper scoring rule, that's just with the sign flipped, but I'm talking about losses because I think 
being familiar with scikit-learn, you might be more familiar with losses than with scores in general, even though this is uh, just a matter of choice of sign. Any questions about this? If there's no questions, I'm going to proceed very quickly with the slide full of formulae. That is meant as a cheat sheet. It will be on the video, and you can look it up. It is also in a comparable form in the cited papers. So this will be a slide of examples, which I'm not going to go through in detail, just for your convenience to look at what commonly used losses are. Okay, this is one question. No, 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 actually five minutes reminder. Okay, five, five minutes reminder. So here's the cheat sheet. You might have seen the cross entropy loss. That's maybe the most popular loss that you use in fitting probabilistic neural networks. There's others. There's some for predictive intervals. For regression, you can do similar things. There's a rank probability loss, so skipping that. It's on the video, right? You can get it from the video. So now I'm going to talk about bad ideas, so things that I have seen in practical, in the practical settings and which are not good things to do. So, and it's not obvious. It's not at all obvious why these are bad things to do. So one way that seems reasonable is, well, if you have a predictive interval and it says this is 95%, this is 50%, just check whether this number, but the number that you observe in practice, how often the value is in this interval is actually 95%. Now that seems reasonable, but the problem is the implication is only one way. Right? So if the prediction is perfect, then of course 95% of the observations will be in a 95% interval, but the reverse is not true because if you think carefully, the label distribution itself will have that property and that doesn't use any information about the features. Second bad idea, well, you're predicting a distribution, so let's just sample from it and stick it in a point prediction loss. Just compute the mean squared error average over samples from the distribution. Maybe it's a sample from the predictive posterior. You stick it in the, oh, and uh, it should be an average, but this is also bad, so no matter how you scale it. So this is also a bad idea, but also for a very subtle reason, and the reason is Jensen's inequality. Because this kind of evaluation favors point prediction. Right? So the, if you measure prediction this way, then predicting the mean of the sample will always be better than averaging over the, because of convexity of the loss, right? Jensen's inequality. Look it up, but it's a bad idea. Also, bad idea number three, three, believe that all uncertainty predictions are correct. And it's obvious why this idea is bad by now, I hope. <laughs> Finally, best modeling and testing practice. So essentially, for estimating the goodness of the model, same principles as in non-probabilistic supervised learning applies to so train test split. Observing performance on the test set is, say, is still a valid principle. Still, you don't want to tune on the test set. It's difficult to enforce if you have off-shelf Bayesian models, so you want to be careful. Or if you use frequentist models, if it's more hygienic, if you use grid search CV to encapsulate the model and don't do anything manual about the um, test and validation split and leave it to grid search CV, say, as in scikit-learn. Of course, computing meaningful confidence intervals for the performances and choosing meaningful baselines is also important. So just like just like in a non-probabilistic setting, though of course the question is what are these meaningful baselines? So the uninformed baseline or uninformed kind of baselines are those that always predict the same kind of outcome here to distribution. So the null model will be the best such uninformed baseline. For classification, you might have heard about it. That's just always predicting the same thing, which is the class frequencies on the training set which estimates the long-term long best uninformed uh, distribution. For regression, it is more complex. There you have to do density estimation. So in a sense, you need to use the best density estimator for the label distribution, ignoring all the features. Then you have another thing, which is non-probabilistic baselines, which is always use the same shape of distribution. Use the scale parameter determined from the label distribution alone and vary the mean. Right, so use one method, say, to predict the mean, and the rest is constant. So scale parameter, you might need to estimate that from the, from the data distribution. 
Right, so that's it. Back to the package itself. So we'll need maybe uh, two or three more minutes. So as said, the features should now be more clear by what I have explained. So model construction included composites such as one method predicts the mean, the other one predicts the variance, and the unified interface, which in this case means it needs to predict distributions, and both in tuning and success control, these probabilistic losses appear. So grid search CV needs to evaluate models by the predictions on in internally, but that can be done because of uh, duct typing in Python, and as well for evaluation, you want to use this uh, uh, proper scoring rules or proper losses. So talking just very briefly, so I'm not going to have time for the Jupyter Notebook, uh, but you have, there's tutorials on the SK Pro webpage, and I'm going to share that after the event, so the notebook I've made for uh, illustration. Now, one of the ideas is to have a distribution interface for the return object, so predict, the result of predict acts as a distribution of which you can call PDF and CDF methods, and that allows you to evaluate these probabilistic losses. You have a composition interface for some of the simpler strategies. One supervised method directly taken from sklearn, say, predicts the mean. The other one predicts the scale parameter. And you can also complicate that with other parameters. You have model diagnostics with the probabilistic. So actual label, predicted label with variance drawn in. And the yellow bars, these are the losses so you can see if an, individual, if an individual prediction has a high loss, that's probably a outlier pair. And benchmarking, so it's a little bit buggy, the benchmarking feature, as said, we're still looking for a new main developer and contributors. Furthermore, so there's actually other projects happening at the Turing which I wanted to mention, of which SK Pro, in which SK Pro might have an important part. So currently, I'm spending most uh, time in the toolbox area on a package that is meant to deal with time series, so supervised learning with time series forecasting, forecasting when examples are available, event modeling, so it has a, a relatively large vision, and currently we're trying to ramp up uh, people power on that one. Now if you do uh, things like time to event modeling, or time series modeling, we're interested in modeling the tails. You want to have some probabilistic interface. So even, even if the development of SK Pro is stolen, we might be reusing part of the probabilistic prediction interface. And if you're interested to be involved in any of these, just let me know or um, apply uh, on the webpage take home messages. First, Probabilistic predictions, so what, what does that mean? The algorithm produces an interval for regression or a full distribution. So one should consider, one should consider the probabilistic classifiers as well as algorithms that return probability mass functions. So it's not so off shelf for regression. That's why the SK Pro vision, I think, is uh, quite helpful. So it's part vision, part an existing thing. Composite workflows that are frequentist, so just take sklearn, uh, different sklearn estimators for different parts of uh, predicting a semi-parametric or a parametric distribution that might also already do the job. And building algorithms, composites, and pipelines just as an sklearn, I think is the way to go up to fully, fully optimizable learning networks or neural network like uh, black box models, which is currently a bit in the future. Second, an algorithm tells you something about its uncertainty. No reason to believe it. That needs checking. So frequentist, Bayesian, or other, still want to check it. And the way to do it is, uh, so one way to do it is via strictly proper losses. And last but not least, we're always looking for competent data scientists. So there are a number of toolbox projects in the PyData ecosystem, some Julia projects as well. So the I think the only currently in development uh, Julia machine learning toolbox is at the Turing. There's a number of Python projects which deal with time series, related tasks, probabilistic tasks, benchmarking. So you may want to get involved in those, help building the next generation of toolbox frameworks where they're currently lacking. 
So if you're available, say full-time or part-time starting June or July for cutting-edge MLAI research, are interested to put your excellent programming skills to use while learning on MLAI, getting involved in applications, and uh, broadening your skill set, talk to me in the break, send an email, or apply via the Turing website. So there are certain fast-track processes affiliated with projects. Of course, there would be a proper application and review process as well. But if you're specifically interested in the Python projects, if you, are, if you have a software development background and a little bit of ML experience, then this is not an opportunity to contribute, but also an opportunity to learn. And we have coffee that flows from taps. <laughs> So thank you very much, Franz, uh, for that talk. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Uh, and when I say question, just to remind everyone, that's not a statement. Uh, that's simply a question uh, said in under one breath. Uh, that hand went up first. There's a microphone just in front of you. There should be a mic there. And press the button to talk on the mic. And I think that'll work. Yes, I can hear you. So computational complexity in general. Could you repeat the question, please? I'm not sure it came out. Between very quick and very long, depending on whether you use an explicit method, stochastic gradient descent, or a number of varieties of Bayesian inference. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I think that's a question that needs a follow-up uh, during the break, or possibly, Franz, are you joining us in the pub at the so end of the evening? So it's mostly an interface. We're, we're, not, we're not actually implemented methods. So we're interfacing pi MC3, and it is as long as pi MC3 takes if you, if you use it. It is as long as scikit-learn takes if you call, if you get linear regression from scikit-learn and put a Gaussian model around that. Is that uh, a more helpful version of this answer? <laughs> as helpful as it's going to be, I think. Um, so uh, let's uh, thank Franz again. Uh,